Good evening, everyone. Write down all your questions for everybody else on the panel. <laughs> now, Fair Park First is the nonprofit that was selected through a competitive solicitation process uh, that the city of Dallas did under uh, Mayor Mike Rollins. Uh, we've been working with uh, Mayor Johnson as well as TC Broadnax. And um, our charge was a couple of things. One, to preserve the history of Fair Park, activate the park on a 365 degree base, uh, 365 day basis, uh, protect the culture of Fair Park, these cultural institutions, and engage the community. So we are a 501 uh, C3. So all the money that David talked about will be beating down his door with some of the things that you're gonna see as we go forward. So one of the things that Mayor Rollins asked us to do was put the park back in the park. So I'm not gonna unveil everything that our guys are gonna talk about tonight. You're gonna see that we did a very pragmatic thing. We were also asked to do a master plan update. There was a 2003 master plan by Hargraves and then there was a mayoral task force in 2013, 2014 that kind of asked us or asked the city to put a nonprofit in place. And that kind of birthed the idea that went through the solicitation process that brought Fair Park First to the forefront. We also have a for-profit partner and I see some of them in the audience. So I'm gonna ask them to, to wave their hands. OVG 360, if you guys can raise your hands and wave. So there's, so when you start to th see the events there in the park and also the management of the things that are happening, the Rolling Stones, Coldplay, the four international soccer events, the, uh, the things that are happening as far as Irish Fest and all of that stuff, these guys bring those to fruition. The fact that you can actually use a uh, debit and credit card inside the Cotton Bowl now, you can actually buy a beer inside the Cotton Bowl, that's uh, their brainchild and the things that they bring to the table. So we're using that because some of the things that we have to do is increase the revenue without driving out our existing cultural institutions, as well as activate the park and manage the new influx of people. You guys may have seen a lot more traffic going on. That's because we're starting to bring in new, new events, new organizations, new activities in some of our buildings. And some of these things that you're gonna see tonight are gonna, gonna take your breath away, uh, but some of them are still aspirational and conceptual. So take those with a grain of salt, but we have been very pragmatic. I happen to be an architect, so I did this very foundationally. We built the master plan. We're, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And when we talk about the community, the only way we could do the master plan update was to engage over 700 conversations. Some of those conversations were in rooms such as this, and some of the other ones were in very small uh, one or two person conversations about what the future of the park is. How do, we, how do we honor the past, pay homage to the things that have come before us, but also how do we make sure that we attract people in the future? Those conversations happen in schools, they happen in churches, they happen in businesses. We also found out that there are 23 distinct neighborhoods. So when we were first gone, when we first went to uh, Park Board, uh, Board President Bobby Atahi said, hey, how many community conversations have you had? And we're like, this was a public solicitation. I'm gonna move this around a little bit because I'm not looking at the whole room. Hi. <laughs> um, and what, they, what, what we told them was, we weren't allowed to talk to anybody until we met with the park board. And from that day, which was uh, July of 2018, until we went back to park board in September, we had over uh, 350 conversations. Because we were intentional about making sure that we had true authentic engagement and we found out what you, as well as others, wanted in the park. This was not, done in the vacuum, this wasn't done in a couple of boardrooms, this was grassroots and making sure that we had a true authentic conversation and engagement. And so the things that you're gonna see tonight are based on conversations and some of those I got yelled at. Some of those my team got yelled at. But you're gonna see the outgrowth of something that everybody in the city of Dallas can be proud of as well as the region. So those 23 neighborhoods 
were never identified in any official city map. So I have to thank our uh, nonprofit partner in the city for good for going out and finding and identifying. And we, f we went to those organizations and made sure that we had those conversations. And so our master plan update is pragmatic. We have a 20 year base contract with two five year extensions, which are at the city's sole discretion. But within the first 20 years, we have to put the park back in the park. And then council member Tanel Atkins said, well, that's great, but I need you to make sure that that's gonna happen. So the park has to be open and operational in the end of five years. So our target is 2024. And right now you're gonna see some great designs and that park will be in 2020, it will be open in 2024. We're talking about breaking ground in uh, January of next year. But before we do that, because we have a lot of organizations and um, cultural institutions that have events, we're taking out surface parking. We had to put a surface parking lot in first. So if you look on the, the right edge of the screen, you'll see the Fitzhugh parking deck and surface parking and in the community park. So that's a 14 acre park. And everybody's gonna look, well the, the Hargraves plan showed it along uh, Robert B. Cullum. The problem is based on those 600, 700, 800 conversations, there was not enough space, there was not enough width to put the park along Fitzhugh. And if anybody's ever gone to the State Fair, I, I could ask everybody to raise their hand, but I'm sure everybody in here has gone and got a corny dog. You know how long it takes to get from gate six to gate five on Fitzhugh on game day. Uh, the community park is picked based on a uh, survey of residents as well as uh, great design planning principles. It is on the perimeter because that park is going to be open and accessible year round. So we're actually going to move the fence line back so that that park is accessible even during the State Fair, Irish Fest, Earth X, any other paid event. So that park will be open and accessible and you're going to see some great things that are going to happen and it's going to be a place where people in Dallas can come to discover. Um, with that, I think I'm going to turn it over to Brian. I don't want to go too deep. I don't want to, there's so much stuff we know. And there's so many things, but I don't want to, I don't want to give away the Easter eggs before they hatch. Brian. Uh, thanks very much everyone for coming. I'm Brian Llewellyn, CEO of Fair Park First. This is a really exciting time for Fair Park. Uh, one of the obvious questions is, what's going on? What have we done to help preserve buildings? What have we done to identify ways to really make sure that this important cultural asset is a better neighbor to the communities that surround us, is a better attribute to the economy of Dallas, and that is also better maintained into the future. Well, the, the good news is quite a lot. Um, we were blessed coming into the project to have over $50 million in bond projects that have helped stabilize some of the most serious areas of deferred maintenance in the park. Those are highlighted in all of the buildings uh, in yellow. We have also begun uh, retenanting a number of the projects with uh, four new tenants in the last 12 months. Those are, by the way, the first new long-term year-round tenants in the park in over 22 years. So that's a fairly significant thing. It varies from the Dallas Sports Commission, who helps uh, bring things like World Cup to Dallas and ideally back to the Fair Park campus. We might chat a little bit about that in a bit. Um, and then, of course, there's focusing on a philanthropic raise uh, that's also going to help build some green space that we can't leverage some of the other funding mechanisms for. Uh, but results matter, right? And there's been a lot of design. There's been some really great feedback on some of the things we've shared with the community. But it's no fun if you can't share some news. And we're very proud to uh, have built a partnership with NCT COG to expand the Santa Fe Trail and wrap it all the way around the Fair Park campus. That's going to connect all of the green spaces that were highlighted as part of the master plan to create a hospitality infrastructure that's sort of devoid if you come and visit Fair Park outside of the State Fair of Texas. It's a uh, Frequently described by Norman Alston, one of our founding board members and now one of our architectural consultants on the Overland team, that Fair Park has seen what you might describe as a forest fire, where the mighty oaks, those Art Deco buildings that we all sort of know and love are still standing, but a lot of the smaller buildings, a lot of the smaller infrastructural pieces simply aren't there outside of the State Fair when they sort of erect temporary versions of those. This is really exciting because the Santa Fe Trail is the second most used walking and biking trail in the entire city. Uh, it's only behind the Katy Trail, and this is going to be a really important amenity to help afford uh, safe pedestrian crossings for the neighborhoods. There are none. 
Uh, if you've ever seen people blithely running across Robert B. Cullum during the State Fair or other events since we got here, there are other events, by the way, uh, that's really exciting. It also connects into the Greater Loop Trail project by eventually moving down buffered bike lanes on Lego. And this one's totally funded. I think most people didn't even know we were working on this, but there's a lot of thoughtfulness that's going to come out of some of the ideas from Perkins and Will. Uh, they're going to be highlighted in just a couple of seconds. And we wanted to meditate just for a second on delivering that. Uh, the goal is to establish that buffered lane that will sort of activate and soften those black fences that we're so well known for. We're going to be taking down a large number of those fences in strategic locations, but there's other places where it makes sense that they stay. This will be divided so that there's a separate lane for our pedestrians, a separate lane for bicyclists, and we anticipate this breaking ground uh, in roughly 12 months. Um, we do have a quicker groundbreaking that we'll talk about in a different section, but this is a very meaningful investment. We know for a fact that there's over 11 neighborhoods that don't have a walkable park that will have one when the community park opens, but without sidewalks, infrastructure, investment, and safe crossings, how do we anticipate those neighbors reaching those? So this is actually uh, a pretty significant driver of a better quality of life for people that have long lived here and uh, frankly have deserved a bit better. And we're able to highlight that with some of the early renderings and concepts that we put together. Here you see a gateway park that'll be built at MLK and Robert B. Cullum, uh, a little bit of a green buffer. Uh, it's a bit of a nod to that idea of a green space along Robert B. Cullum highlighted in the Hargraves plan. But you also see the loop trail linking around it. We've always known that we needed this. We were very pleased to partner with COG and be able to bring this forward. But the ideas in the master plan, uh, those that we've already delivered on and those that we'll be talking about through the rest of the night are very important. And uh, it's really with this slide in mind, I'd like to pass this over to Ron and let him talk a little bit more about the master plan itself and how we got there and uh, ultimately how we're ensuring that this park is well-preserved, well-used, and active on a year-round basis. Ron? Good evening. I'm, I'm Ron Perkins and Will. And uh, to Darren's point, and even what Brian's talking about, you know, a lot of you probably know the quote by Mark Twain. You know, I didn't have time. So I wrote such a long letter, I didn't have time for a short one. And in fact, um, we don't have time for a short one or a long one necessarily because the layers are so deep and so rich. I, I consider this to be a, a really hyper-contemporary situation that we have on this site because not only is it a socioeconomic, you know, cultural, and environmental issue, but we're dealing with historic preservation. We've got the arts. Mobility is a big thing. And so all of these are really entangled in a, in a way that you don't always get to confront. So um, we wanted to have this image up here as well to show you know, it's very ordinary in some ways, but it's powerful in that when you recognize that none of this currently exists at many of these entry points. There aren't tree canopies. There aren't necessarily permeable surfaces, trails. And in fact, you don't see people like that always walking around. Uh, but you know, a couple of the key fundamental big ideas that we had to bring was a lot about uh, access and circulation. And when we say access, it's both uh, you know, physical access and just perceptual access. You know, how do people enter the space? Do they feel welcome? Do they feel invited? Uh, but we looked at you know, some really clever ways to create these linkages and, and talk about how connections through the park would make it much more porous and really ensure that as you're moving through the space, um, it's not going to be um, a place that is, feels like there's the have and have nots in certain locations. There wants to be cohesion, consistency, and really a, a threaded uh, experience all the way through. The sense of discovery is gonna be really important here. And then of course, when you talk about the environmental aspects, you can see here in a very clear diagram, it's about you know, these park edges that really is a condition that we all know is, is probably the, the most uh, challenging issue overall. How welcoming can a park be? How welcoming can a park, you know, should it be? Uh, but with this belt and with these parklets that you see at the entry points, uh, we create an environment that activates that fence line. It really does speak to the nature of how people will be brought through the space. Uh, and, and it's clear that you know, this park needs major transformation. There's, there's a ton of really great data points. I mean, this is a 277-acre park, uh, of which over 200 acres are impervious. So when you think about just the amount of rain that, that comes to this site, the water you have to deal with, the hydrology, everything that really um, could have a, a negative impact, it has a real great chance to sort of feed the site. And we really started referring to that as almost this hydrotherapy. Can you think about uh, using the water that comes to the site in a way that nurtures and, and grows the site? Uh, but you know, like all great projects and master plans, um, you need that pin to drop and really lock things in. And for this project, it was the community park. There were so many conversations that we've talked about 
Uh, but these wouldn't necessarily be possible in terms of a sequence and a phasing if you didn't have a framework that could solidify a broader idea. You know, we gained confidence with the community. We built that layer of trust, and we were able to really talk about ways that we were giving back and not overlooking uh, what was already happening there, and in fact, wanted to ensure there was not going to be any further cultural erasure. And so the, the park itself, combined with parking, starts to bring a, a major piece of, of social infrastructure that's going to really anchor one side of the site and then grow forward. And so you're going to see some great things happening here. And this is all the foundation. And um, again, the map, the road map is what's important. Uh, but I hope we can all celebrate in 2036 um, when we, we come back and see how this is really transformed. But from there, I'll let the others take over. Thank you. All right. So. We've, we've had a lot of questions about why would you put the park on the back side of the park? Well, I'm an architect. There is no back side of a park. There are neighborhoods around this entire park, so we have to look at this as a place that has a front door completely surrounding it. And so I talked about the 600 or 700 conversations we had on the, on the uh, master plan update. We had another 250 unique conversations specific to the community park because we, we didn't just stop the community engagement because we had we delivered a master plan. We wanted to make sure that the community park also had that same type of robust, authentic conversations. And these things are images of the things that we heard from the community. When you go out and talk to people from that are not in the design space, you have to ask people how they're going to use the space. So we got people that talked about chess. We talked about people that were they wanted water play. We talked about people that wanted nature walks and I, could, I mean exercise and and discovery and movie nights and so what we found is you just can't have a postage stamp of a park in 277 acres ron already talked about that uh, a majority of that is already impervious so we're adding nature so that we can change the heat island inside this so as you see this park was now as a concept out of uh, Perkins and Will Master Plan, we hired Studio MLA, BC Workshop, Allison G. Williams, and Studio Outside. Studio Outside and BC Workshop are our neighbors. They are in exposition, so they're right across the street. They were vested in making sure that this park is going to be aspirational. And what we asked them to do was make sure that this park draws people in from across the street but across the region. And you have a stage, and you'll see a little kiss. We call it a little kiss. But it brings people in, and we've got a front porch. And it's impervious and poor so that people along Fitzhugh can now walk into the park. There's not, not going to be a fence line along um, Fitzhugh any longer. It's going to go back along Pennsylvania. But now we've got a big central lawn, we've got a community lawn, we've got a, a community stage. There's a lot of events, obviously we're on a stage tonight, but we've got a lot of stages and places where nonprofits and community organizations can come use this park for free. We've got the first dog park that we know that is in South Dallas. We've got play places for all, for all ages and all abilities. We've got a uh, market grove and we've got all kind of things where people can come. We've got bridges and we could go on and on as, as Ron said earlier. Um, there are some, we've got a little, what we call the Texas tornado with Pecos Bill where we've got a place where people can climb and get great views. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brian so he can go in a little bit more detail on what the park is gonna look like. Thank you, Darren. As you can tell, we tag team this a lot. Uh, it's a pretty seamless handoff when we do this stuff. Uh, so we were really excited to be able to finally take out these renderings just a couple of weeks ago and really show people what the scale of the park would be. It, it's very easy to get lost in the scale of Fair Park. Uh, we're 277 acres. Uh, the space where this community park will be built was the site of hundreds of working class and middle class uh, black homes. And when those were taken away through abusive eminent domain, low ball offers, it left a really deep wound in the surrounding community. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons that this site resonated so much in many of the conversations in the surrounding area. Uh, but it was actually its proximity to Lego and its ability to meet the plan and meet the program behind this that really cited this. Even though 82% of the people that live in the surrounding area supported this location and the location right next to it. So much of that had to do with Lego 
and the fact that that is one of the few thoroughfares that the surrounding neighbors can use to come into the park when we have major events. Robert B. Cullum is overly congested. Uh, it was underbuilt for the population growth that we're seeing around the Metroplex for the level of events that we bring here. We have a planning disaster, as I affectionately call it, on Perry Avenue, because one of our main thoroughfares has two light rail crossings at surface, which means on the days when you need to move a lot of people through, you have to stop it repeatedly. And in fact, you want more people to use DARP. That means more trains are coming, which means you have to stop cars more often. So there's a lot of infrastructural work that goes into this, but when you really look at the human scale of this being a space where for 14 and a half acres, people's lives, their generational wealth, was taken away. I, th I think it's important to re reflect on how close this is to the core of our city. Uh, this has long been a city with, uh, you know, it's, its story about how life is north of 30 and south of 30. And it was ambitious early on to embrace the idea that our neighbors deserve nothing less than they would find at well amenitied parks in other parts of the city. Uh, we see sensory play being built into this park because there is none throughout many of the these southern uh, neighborhoods and their parks. We see 11 neighborhoods having a walkable park for the first time, and more neighborhoods will be served by additional green spaces in the future. Uh, Wi-Fi is a huge amenity. It was the number one ask from the surrounding neighbors, not necessarily something you might think of when you think of green space, but when one looks at the digital divide and the inequity for the infrastructure of broadband internet, which is so essential, this needed to be an area of respite, and we've incorporated that in a lot of ways. We know that this will uh, be a space that's heavily activated throughout uh, special events. That's part of our DNA, it's part of our character, but it's also an area that will be available for free 365 days a year, including during the State Fair of Texas. We're simply shifting those paywalls that you might think of to ensure that there's always equitable access. Here you see the 4th of July. By the way, I hope to see all of you at Fair Park 4th on Monday. It's going to be a beautiful day, and we're very happy to have the longest uh, fireworks show that we've had in a very long time in the park. It's really exciting to think about that becoming a green space where families can really enjoy their time, an area of respite, and uh, have a bit of healing. But we also addressed uh, very specific needs. We were challenged with how do we help address food inequities? It probably doesn't make a lot of sense to bring a grocery store into the footprint of a national historic landmark. Uh, plus, when we have major events, how does anyone get to it? That's another one of those infrastructure problems. But with our agrarian history, the idea of activating regular farmers markets that are also tapped into local programs that have urban uh, agriculture made a lot of sense. Uh, we have found a great organization that will be activating these on a regular basis and some of that programming already exists because we've been able to help relocate the MLK Food Park, its former uh, location was developed, that's now here at the Fair Park campus available for free this summer. And uh, this will really just be an outgrowth of that same kind of program. We also see night markets that highlight local, independent, minority-owned businesses in a same, similar way. But when we think about parks, obviously green space is a key driver. This park is going to feature over an acre of play space divided across three primary areas, a prairie playground, an adventure play area that is uh, really oriented towards some of our older kids and the young at heart like myself that might still like a zip line or like to climb across some net structures, and also a rock hill that incorporates active slides and active play in a really exciting way so that people of all ages, all abilities can really engage. But to make that happen, we have to create some additional infrastructure. Uh, it was really fun when the stories ran in the Dallas Morning News and people would comment, and as they do on social media, great, you've built a beautiful park, but no place for people to park. Well, we thought about that, and uh, we challenged a separate team, because we have a little bit of a truncated delivery schedule for this park, uh, to come up with a, com a design that was entirely holistic, so that when they were done, you never saw uh, two separate projects, but rather one holistic expansion of green space across the park. Uh, we recently shared these, and we're so excited because of activities that are coming to the Fair Park campus to expand the 14 and a half acre community park proper with an additional four and a half acres of green space. It brings us up to over 18 acres of green space being built in the first five years, and once you add in the additional space from the loop trail, we're up to uh, 22 and a half acres, which almost doubles the amount of green space in Fair Park, and that's being built out in the first five years alone. 
Uh, we think that's pretty exciting. We hope that uh, this also takes away that impression of this being the backside of the park. There needs to be a beautiful sense of arrival. You're coming to a space that's very, very important to millions of visitors uh, from around the world, from around the region, and from around the Metroplex. And so this needs to be welcoming. It needs to feel hospitable. It needs to also not become another wall, just another vertical construct that appears empty when not activated. And so very clever landscaping and berming allow us to actually also build in additional infrastructure that's needed. We're landlocked. We can't increase the size of the park, and we don't want to, but we do need some things that we don't have today. We do not have a centralized warehouse, for an example, which means we have to leave equipment out, weathering. These berms are actually going to hide a 70,000 square foot space, and by building these berms over the top, we have areas built out atop that that'll be Wi-Fi activatable, places where you can take a moment, send a couple of emails if you're on your way to an event at the Dos Equis Amphitheater, or do your homework if you don't have access in your home. It means that this, too, becomes an extension of the park. And uh, that's not to say we've forgotten about the buildings. In fact, we're, we're really quite anxious to move forward with a, a tremendous opportunity. I'm going to close this out and talk a little bit about this in detail. But um, there is an effort to utilize the expansion of the convention center to generate the single biggest capital investment ever in Fair Park at no cost to local voters. We anticipate this passing um, when the city calls the election. They'll do that at some point in August as per code. And then on November 8th, there'll be an opportunity for all of you to come and support the idea of expanding our tourism infrastructure and most importantly, preserving Fair Park for future generations. Um, this is really exciting, and so we brought on a new team to help expand on the ideas in the master plan, take them to that next level of specificity, and take those out. And to chat these through, I want to introduce Katie from the Overland team, who's going to walk you through some pretty amazing images. Wow, thanks everybody for coming. This is a very exciting opportunity for us. This is, you guys are probably the first people to see a lot of these images, so it's gonna knock your socks off. <laughs> so for those of you less familiar with phase two of this project, uh, Overland was approached by Fair Park to get involved in an already established part of the master plan where 10 specific buildings that are of the highest priority are to start being addressed and move forward, to start being preserved and um, improved for the future use of Fair Park. So we have identified seven exhibition spaces and three of the major venues. For the exhibition spaces, our exercises are primarily based around improvements of infrastructure so that more programmatic you know, activities can come to these spaces and then being used in that 365 day a year you know, ambition that Fair Park has already established. We're looking at the preservation of a lot of the historical nature of these buildings. There's some you know, deterioration occurring that we really want to keep preserving so that Fair Park can withstand for 100 more years past today. We are looking at even digging up some of the things that have been hidden over time and unveiling historical things that a lot of people in this room have probably never even seen. So it's a pretty exciting um, scope of work just for those buildings alone. But then there's the three major venues that we have as well. And that's some of the most exciting stuff we have here today that will affect everybody. We're working on uh, the Cotton Bowl, the Coliseum, and the Band Shell. And taking a look at them from a holistic point of view of improving the fan experience. You know, these are three amazing buildings that have been here for almost 100 years now and that have hosted some really significant events in Dallas, They've been locally significant, nationally significant, and for the exhibitions, you know, internationally significant. So these, it's easy enough to say, let's knock them down and build something new. You know, that's the strategy for venues of entertainment. Um, but this is not what we want to do for Fair Park. This is not the vision. There's a huge historic value here, and that's been core to how we've moved forward with a lot of what we've been proposing. So we'll start with the Cotton Bowl. Um, Cotton Bowl, not necessarily built for the exhibitions of 1936, but opened six years prior, coming up on 100 years in age, has hosted some significant events. We've had World Cup of 1994 happen here. We're now going to introduce it back to Cotton Bowl, not necessarily for games, but we'll have it for some practice, and hopefully the IBC will be hosted here as well. Stay tuned for later in the year. Um, we've got cold play that just occurred here. We have 90,000 seats in this building. There is no other stadium in the state that can do that. So that's why we maintain the Texas OU game. You know, AT&T can't compete with that, even though that's a world-class facility. So there's just a lot here 
that we want to preserve. There's a lot here of value, but there's just a lot of lacking in what we can actually provide here in the building. So when you just take a look at kind of the existing space, it's really, really broken and segmented up in a way that isn't necessarily functional for the stadium today. It doesn't cater to fans and how fans experience content today. And so we've taken a look at how we can kind of address some of these things. So I'll go back to this slide. So we looked at introducing tons of new products in this building. So this isn't necessarily to, to segregate or add any, you know, in, you know, increased pr ticket pricing or anything like that. But there's a lot of people in this building and people do consume content in different ways. So we wanna provide variety. We wanna stick with a lot of the language pre-established in the master plan about exploration and people being allowed to freely move around and kind of choose experiences and, and how they wanna engage with what they've arrived for, whether it's a concert, whether it's to watch the practice of a soccer game or if it's Texas and OU. So another big you know, thing we wanna kind of achieve with the Cotton Bowl is if you were not to know where you were in this picture, you would not know you were in Fair Park. You know, this does not feel of the time. You know, this does not feel on the interior of the building that it was built during an Art Deco era and it was built by George Dahl or any of those renowned architects that created everything for the exhibitions. So a big goal for us as a team, us for Fair Park, and a lot of the pre-established you know, goals already set is that we need to kind of keep this, anything that we propose, nod back to where it came from. You know, it wasn't modeled or even designed intentionally to be of the Art Deco, but we wanna bring this back into the Art Deco. So we'll show, I think that's coming up soon. So here you can kind of see a lot of our interventions that we're talking about. You've got 90,000 people right now displacing into three different concourses. It's very congested. For a lot of people, that's a nostalgic thing. People love to be up on each other for certain events. They just love it. But not everybody does. Um, <laughs> I don't, but uh, you know, some people do. So part of what we've been looking at is not only providing more inventory, more places for people to go, more people for places to explore, um, but for also people to, or for Fair Park to introduce new ways to bring in revenue, creating new experiences, creating new things that they can offer the people of Dallas and offer the people that attend any type of event here. So we've added an expanded you know, product program that allows people to really start to choose what they're doing when they come to the stadium and not feel as though they're kind of restricted to their wooden bench, if you will. So here is um, the first revealing publicly of our proposal conceptual design for what the concourses might start to look like and setting a design language for how this park is going to start to feel in this building and how we're going to you know, bring in this idea of the built architecture art deco style that the entire park has inside this building. So it's no different than feeling like you're just walking through the park. You know, you'll just kind of feel like you're experiencing Fair Park and you're experiencing history. And these things may not be original, but they are going to be so respectful of where Fair Park came from. We're also looking at the Coliseum. You know, this is a really interesting building as well. It's not necessarily in the Art Deco style in the traditional sense of the rest of the park, but it is a significant building. It hosts a lot of events. We have spent effortless hours assessing and studying this building and what it needs to bring it up to the 21st century, which is really the goal of most of what we're doing here. So this is kind of a before pushed together image so you guys can get a good, see there's trees that block it in real life. So this is our proposal. So a lot of the kind of issues that wrap around um, the Coliseum right now is there's a big disconnect. So a big message for this project as a whole is connection, bringing people in, being able to move through it freely. And right now we have a very divided building where people have to enter and exit a building to get back into the building just to explore it further. So we've come up with you know, these solutions where we can actually connect the building into each other, allow people to move around, provide views out into the park so people still feel connected to the rest of Fair Park even when they're experiencing an event inside the venue. This also increases the seat counts and allows for a better setting for concerts. So this is the interior today. You can kind of see these sort of disconnected seating arrangements where people have to leave a bowl and go back around to get back in again. And this is what we propose. It's much more inclusive. It feels as though everyone's in here together to experience something. 
and it's a little bit more interactive and people can you know, disconnect and walk out of a seat and still feel a part of the message. Our final venue that we're studying is the band shell, often referred to as the jewel of Fair Park. Um, this has hosted some really interesting events. It's small in scale, roughly 4,000 seats, but it has hosted Shakespeare in the Park, symphonies, small style concerts, but it's starting to feel as though it's been difficult to book only because of our unpredictable weather here in Texas. Um, when entities like Live Nation want to book an event ahead of time, there's no real guarantee that it won't be canceled and they'll have to move it somewhere else. So a huge effort that we've been researching is how do we incorporate a shade structure or a covering that is going to be respectful of this building and the historical nature and not deter but amplify this really iconic structure that we would never want to take away from. So here is a conceptual rendering of what that would kind of feel like. And what this kind of does is it really amplifies the iconic shape of the band shell, really draws you in, this protects you from the rain, it protects you from the sun, allowing people to want to be here for a little bit longer, having longer events take place. And the, you know, the idea that you could almost become an immersive environment, not in the technology traditional black box sense, but that you know, these entire blades, these whole canopies could light up and you could just feel like you're in this amazing, immersive, intimate setting. Also including some more F&B here. There are none to date. People do have to leave the park. So being able to provide something that's a little bit more inclusive, that keeps people longer, that makes people want to stay, spend more money so that Fair Park can continue to do the good work that they're doing. So now I'm going to pass it back to Brian to wrap us up. I know you all have questions, but I get to exert a little bit of executive privilege because I get to work on this thing we all love every single day for many, many, many hours. Uh, my days start early, they end very late, and I'm going to invest that privilege in one simple idea, and that is there's some pretty amazing things coming our way. You know, we have proven that we can take on AT&T Stadium head-to-head, -head, along with, by the way, NRG and the Alamo Dome, and bring significant events to the Cotton Bowl once again. That hasn't happened in decades. We've been very successful. Uh, even this weekend, we were joined by thousands of people for a fellowship event uh, that was uh, well-received despite incredible heat. We've got to be ready for this, but the amenities and the facilities that we talk about as a crown jewel simply haven't been polished the way you'd expect. The same story you may hear in the coming weeks and months as we lead into this referendum opportunity about the convention center and having piecemeal solutions has happened in Fair Park. If it rains in Dallas, it's raining in Fair Park. And I don't mean outside, I mean in every single building, including the music hall. Uh, <laughs> The Music Hall is an incredible performing arts center. They host the best of Broadway. They host some of the most successful touring acts in the world. Uh, they also host weird indie uh, German music, if anybody was here for craft work other than me. <laughs> and there's no sexy renderings of the Music Hall or the Automobile Building or the Centennial Building because really the vision is, imagine if we cared. Imagine if we as a city preserved our past and invested in our future the same way we like to build new things. Imagine if uh, the flywheels and the system for rigging behind the stage at the music hall was actually up to date. Imagine if you came to an event at the Automobile or Centennial Building and the restrooms worked. <laughs> Imagine a cotton bowl that has more than tripled in capacity over the years. I promise we didn't triple the restrooms we did not triple the concessions. There's a reason the lines are that long. I have an ask. If you care about Fair Park, educate yourself about this opportunity. This will cost local taxpayers nothing unless you make a habit of staying in hotel rooms here in the city of Dallas. It's entirely optional. It's going to make us more competitive. And today, before they call the election, I can do this as a nonprofit. I want your vote. Please vote yes to support this because this is the single biggest investment in Fair Park history. In fact, the anticipated proceeds coming out of that referendum election are going to be greater than every single dollar that has been invested here in total from all sources since 1936. It's an incredible game-changing amount and it gives Fair Park a real future and that's what we're here to talk about. But uh, 
Now we'll go back over to those questions that I know you all want to ask, and I'll bring David back up to uh, bring us all out to the chairs. Well, thank you to all of our wonderful panelists here tonight to uh, talk about lots of great ideas for Fair Park and lots of things that we hope will happen very soon. And like Brian said, hopefully we will have that bill pass in November so we can have, how much would, how much would that provide for Fair Park? Do we need, a, we need a drum roll for that? We probably do because uh, the relative conservative estimates put that at over $300 million coming into Fair Park facilities. They'll include the Music Hall, the Cotton Bowl, the Band Shell, the Coliseum, and the Automobile and Centennial buildings. There's additional buildings that need work, but really we approach everything as a capital stack. And there's opportunities for major investment in these facilities if we leverage these opportunities correctly. Uh, historic rehabilitation tax credits, as an example, can be well used to help take care of some of the other buildings that aren't available for that. And then what that does is it takes care of a huge amount of deferred maintenance. Uh, the master plan that was adopted over a year and a half ago unanimously by the park board and the city council recognized over $333 million in critical projects. That's not all of it. That's just what's urgent. There are significant pieces of art at Automobile and Centennial, incredible irreplaceable uh, bas-relief carvings by Bordell that I am not exaggerating will fall off the building at some point if we don't intervene very significantly. And this allows us a vehicle to do that without costing local taxpayers or the general fund for the city of Dallas one, one cent. So 300 conservatively, we anticipate leveraging that for more opportunities. And again, it's, it, they haven't called the election, so I'm not electioneering today. <laughs> Vote yes, November 8th. Tell, tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell strangers at the airport. If they can find a way to vote, vote yes. So we're speaking in hypotheticals. Right now? Uh, no, until they call the election, I can be as crass as I want to be. After that, I have to be a, a nonprofit and I will educate, but I will not openly ask you to vote yes on November 8th. That's right. Subliminal so now, message yeah. vote yes. Vote yes, vote yes. Uh, so, with that, there are only certain buildings that can fall under the um, monetary when that money comes in from the taxes. But explain why that is. Uh, I'm happy to. You know, this is uh, a funding mechanism that has often been called the Brimer Bill after the author. The, the city of Dallas has only ever used this funding mechanism one time to build the American Airlines Center. And they did that very successfully. It's such a powerful mechanism. It adds an optional 2% uh, tourist tax, basically, on top of all of those fees we all pay when we visit anywhere and we check out of a hotel. There's all of these little things at the bottom. This is one of those. Other cities like Houston and Austin have used this seven, eight times each. So this is a powerful mechanism, but it's never been available to Fair Park because it excluded parks entirely. We had to build over the course of years uh, a groundswell of interest for this to be changed in the legislator or the legislation. And uh, we saw great leadership by Royce West, Jasmine Crockett, Angie Shin Button, Morgan Meyer. It was really a bipartisan effort. Uh, starting with Rafael Anchia to really give Fair Park a unique opportunity. And you might anticipate the hotel lobby to, to oppose something like that. They're very powerful in Austin, but in fact, we're the number two generator of room nights. In an average year, Fair Park helps produce over 150,000 hotel room nights in the city of Dallas using Visit Dallas's own data. That means we're viable in a very unique way. So now, uh, they changed the law. It doesn't say Fair Park anywhere in it, but in the state of Texas, if you are a municipally owned park that is in a city of more than a million people, that is more than 100 acres, that is also a national historic landmark, you can use this tool. Uh, but they did carve it out pretty adeptly. Uh, you know, when they created this unprecedented opportunity for us to do this, uh, they limited it to things that they believed would drive tourism. So the African American Museum is a great example, uh, is a building that does need additional investment. It's just not one of the categories that, that it was identified in the legislation. So we'll be able to talk about investments there at the Texas Discovery Gardens or some of the other facilities through the same general obligation uh, tools that we have always had for the park. This is the unprecedented side of it. And it's gotta be venues, stadiums, uh, exhibition halls, basically what this mechanism was designed for all over the state. Great. I wanna uh, talk a little bit about Fair Park first. First, uh, tell us about the um, 
plans that y'all have been working on outside of, of what you heard, have you heard earlier, because I understand that you, you're involved in more than just the future, you're involved in the current right now and working to uh, really dispel the myth that nothing happens out here at Fair Park. So tell us a little bit of some of the things you're doing to dispel that. There's a lot that happens at Fair Park. One of the first things you may have heard us all collectively say campus. One of the first thing we noticed when we got here is that there were disparate cultural institutions that kind of worked together when they needed to, but not all the time. So we wanted to create a collegial feel. And so we started to call Fair Park a campus. And what that started to do was get everybody to think collectively. So Texas Discovery Gardens has a host of wedding receptions. We make sure that we help amplify that. Uh, obviously, uh, the uh, music hall does a host of, uh, now they're called Broadway Dallas instead of Dallas Summer Musicals. They had uh, Wicked and Hamilton and all kind of events. They also do hip hop shows, they do rock concerts, and they do com uh, comedy shows. So we're looking to help source that. Live Nation, who's been programming uh, Dos Equis for the last, I'm gonna say five, maybe seven years. Now they're actually amplifying how many programs they do. Now we could always go back and hit the, the nail on the head. Everybody knows Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. They came here. When Brian mentioned NRG and AT&T, they came here. They didn't go to AT&T. They didn't go to A NRG. We also had, who knows K-pop, the Korean pop group BTS. Raise your hand, <laughs> wow, there we go. We actually landed BTS. This was gonna be the only stop in Texas. They had two shows here. And then we had something called, I think COVID. <laughs> and so we had to postpone, postpone, and then they have a uh, mandatory military service, so they're not gonna be coming back anytime soon, but we hope they will come back at some point in the future. And then who went to Coldplay? Raise your hands, this is interactive. Let's make this interactive. <laughs> so I went to Coldplay. I went to see her, but I actually went to see Coldplay as well. Those, those light up bracelets, man, that is incredible. I've, I've been to other concerts where they have light up bracelets, but those light up bracelets. <laughs> and then we have four soccer matches. Those are the things that we're doing on a daily basis. We also had the very first year, um, it was Comic-Con. That, that was a comic event that comes out and we've had Dinosaur in the Park and then we also had Enchant Christmas. We had 231,000 people come through the park from the end of November to the first week in January for a light up Christmas event. They're coming back. So those are the things that we're doing in addition to the things that our cultural institutions are doing on their basis. And then the fact that we've got the Children's Aquarium They've come in and activated the park. We've seen more buses and field trips and things come through because you actually can pet a stingray. So as, as Brian said, he's a, he's a child at heart. Everybody else is, go pet the stingray. <laughs> you know, the only thing I want to add to that is uh, he mentioned four soccer games. We actually have one of the premier soccer stadiums in the entire world, and last year, the Cotton Bowl hosted more international soccer than any other stadium in this hemisphere. We closed the year as the 37th busiest stadium in the entire world because of its magnitude and because of the amount of, very specifically, Latin soccer games that gravitate to that. Uh, but it's a, it's a worldwide feature. In fact, we're going to be hosting Barcelona and Juventus from Italy, uh, the two of the greatest teams in Europe. They're gonna be playing in just a couple of weeks. Uh, hope to see you there, but I'm not giving any tickets away tonight. Everything we do is a fundraiser, so if you buy a ticket, you're helping support Fair Park first. So with all these people coming to Fair Park, I understand that there is a visitor center yes. that is under development. Tell us about that. So Brian mentioned the Sports Commission. Uh, we also have uh, 20 interns from Lincoln and Madison. In the Museum of Nature and Science, um, once Perot vacated and moved out, uh, we were actually able to repurpose that facility, uh, protect the dioramas, but we moved in the Sports Commission, and we also have our interns housed there. But that's going to be the first place you go to get oriented as you come to the park. So the first place we have is a visualization center. So all the images that you see tonight, you're going to be able to go there and see those. But it's also going to give you orientation. 277 acres 
is a massive park. And if anybody has come to the park, we saw influx of people come through in COVID. Um, they're always like, well, how do I get here and how do I get here? You can go to the visitor center at Museum of Nature and Science and now find your way apart, around the park. It's not quite open yet, but it's coming. Permits, guys, it just <laughs> takes time. But I will say, uh, it's very exciting, because really in the park's modern history, there's never been an obvious place uh, where you could go get a map, figure out what other programs are available today. Uh, we launched the park's first ever box office, so you can buy tickets for upcoming events. And uh, also, the beautiful dioramas haven't been on display publicly since 2011, and yet they are protected at the local, state, and federal level. We have to make sure they're in beautiful condition for posterity. Why not show those to our guests, give them a taste of Fair Park's past, and then also help introduce some ideas uh, as to Fair Park's future? That's what we're here to talk about. Great. So I want to move on to the, uh, talk a little bit about the master plan. And Ron, tell us how long that process took and how many people were involved in that, because that was quite a Herculean yeah. effort. Yeah, I mean, it was a couple years long. I, mean, I can't really you know, keep track of everything. There was, there was so, it was so dynamic, and that's the, the, the best way to describe it. There were, you know, we went wide, we cast the big net, we worked with the team just to understand, you know, because there were, of course, the community um, you know, stakeholders, but then there's the existing tenants, and then there's just you know, the general population and how people move through the, the city. Uh, so for us, um, it was just taking stock of everything, trying to understand the sense of time. And that's the one thing I really gained from this was looking at the heat maps. We did a lot of heat maps to study what facilities and venues are being used, how often, and where is the overlap, and where are these points of intensity? And that helped to start to guide us to think about to create balance throughout the, the entire campus. Um, you know, we, as Darren uh, mentioned earlier, we were in basements of churches. We were in large halls, uh, conducting large uh, you know, meetings with everyone. Uh, but we did listen. And I think the most important uh, suggestion, or most interesting suggestion we had along the way was to communicate with the community, was to consider advertising these meetings on the top of pizza delivery boxes. I mean, it was one of those things where, you know, is, again, it was, was said earlier that you know, Wi-Fi was something that maybe wasn't um, as readily available. And so uh, our perception of what uh, means of communication were really going to be relevant. Uh, we had to think differently. We couldn't just send out a blast. You know, let's think about the pizza box stops, things like that. So we had to calibrate our, our sense of place. But as you saw on the screen, our view was it was very, you know, considerate of the ground plane, but we were really 2,000 feet high. I mean, the promenade is, is great. The cotton bowl is a large patch. And there's these moments that occur throughout the, the site um, we weren't looking to change a lot of the pieces. We were looking to refine them and, again, stitch them together. So connectivity as the theme was really what drove us. And I think that was, you know, it was connectivity from macro on paper all the way down into the personal level. We made a lot of friends, and like I said earlier, we built trust within, you know, the community. And I think that always goes a long way. So you were thinking outside of the box with the uh, flyers the on box. top of the Yeah, there. outside the box. Don't put it inside the box. It's, <laughs> it's, it's messy. Box. Yes. So I noticed on the, the plan that the target date is uh, 2036. So obviously I'm assuming that was intentional, so we will be ready to uh, host the bicentennial, the Texas bicentennial at that point. Was that part of the plan? Uh, 100%. And not only that, it's, uh, you know, we celebrated the, the Texas centennial here in 1936, that great spirit of, of our pioneering way that was born in blood at the Battle of the Alamo 100 years before. This will be our centennial. And that's significant. And it, it, we obviously are going to host the bicentennial celebration of our great state here because we do it every year for millions of people, right? Uh, I don't engage in a huge amount of bravado, but there might be a city council meeting where I said over my dead body would that go to San Antonio. <laughs> uh, I have family in San Antonio, but we celebrate Texas. We're a temple to Texas uh, that welcomes over six million people a year today when people assume that nothing happens outside of the fair. The reality is we are built to celebrate Texas for future generations. Now we do need some big ideas to get there and that's one of the reasons we've leaned very heavily into the region-wide bid for World Cup. And we see that as one of the significant things that will serve as mile markers. But nothing is more important to us as an organization than delivering on the community part because that is a 45-year-old broken promise to our most immediate neighbors. And I think once we establish that, um, it's full speed ahead until 2036.
if you look at everything we're doing, it's how do we activate the park, preserving the history, but also energize people to recognize that Fair Park. Fair Park is in everybody's conversation now. If you turn on the news, you hear Fair Park. I get a smile every time, because when I first moved here, you didn't hear that. And my uh, general manager, Peter, who is my partner in crime, always says, everybody always says nothing happens in Fair Park, and he starts every board meeting with a laundry list of things that happen. So things happen here, but that all goes to how do we get the state to recognize that there's nowhere else the bicentennial should be other than Fair Park. Definitely. We need some legislation to put that in cement. All right, let's talk yeah, a little well, bit. Real quickly, I, I, I just want to be honest here. We've already started, and now nonprofits uh, do not lobby, but we advocate, and that looks a lot like lobbying. And we're pretty good at it, right? So we've already started advocating for that to come here. And anytime anybody in Austin will listen to us, uh, we, we are preaching to the choir, I hope, that the Bicentennial should be here. Definitely. All right, let's talk a little bit about the uh, community park. Um, now this is a very, it, it's going to be really a game changer for, for Fair Park itself. But tell us how the two are going to interact with each other and what it's going to mean for the community in being able to use this additional park within Fair Park. So the intent is, is that it draws you through the park. As, as Ron talked about, we're looking at nodes of connectivity and spaces that you can come to Fair Park, you can go to a play, you can go to the African American Museum. Uh, Mick Jagger actually took a tour of the park and he went through the African American Museum. Um, so those are the type of things that we're looking for. So the park is interactive and we're looking for people to come to the park. Even if they just come to the community park, there's so many different activities and zones and things you can do. You can play chess one day, you can do yoga the next day, you can come back and see a concert the day after. You can go to the Market Grove during the day, buy some fresh fruit and then come back and buy some art later that night. The, the activity is so that, I mean, the intent is that there is something for everybody. Everybody's got a little bit different intent. And as you started, we started to do surveys and we started to activate. If you actually go to the lagoon, there's, there's actually little pop-up events now that we're looking to see. What do people want to do when they come to the park? We actually have a, a all-weather ping pong table out there. So those are going to be certain things. That's today. So we're looking at how do we continue to activate that. We're going to have a program. It's not just having green space, but it's programs. So we're going to have a program to park so people come to the park for different activities. But it what does help the, the bookend. I was just going to say you know, it does help to bookend the two sides of the park. I mean, the, the entry point off the dart line, I mean, it's very celebratory, and there's a lot of pageantry there, and you move through the promenade. But the, the ability to that then have a destination and that, that it's a gateway. I, I mean, a lot, a lot of people will say it's the community being let into the park, but I think it's the park also reaching out to the community. I mean, it works that way to where it's stretching its arms and, and embracing in, in the reverse order. And I think that's, you can't um, undervalue what that will do in terms of trying to you know, mend a, a lot of what's been going on over time here. So it, it's experiential and it's symbolic. And I think that's the, the really fantastic thing about all the different activities that are happening around stretches the edges, yeah. And the community was a large part in designing the park. Talk to us about that. So people say community engagement. They're like, oh, we're just gonna check the box and put a couple of dots on the screen. And I was like, no, Ron's right. He sat in some living rooms with me and he was in some church basements and he was upstairs. So we had 250 distinct conversations related directly to the park. We actually activated the Coliseum and had kids come in and do activities with Allison and BC Workshop on what they were looking for. And we had kids starting to sketch and do things. So this wasn't a park because we could, we could talk to everybody that's sitting in the room, but we also wanted to talk to some of the young people because they're gonna be here for decades to come as well. And see, we want, we want to have a park that is a living thing so that people can come visit it and bring their next generation. Because all the stories we hear when we started to do our community engagement is like, I remember when my grandmother brought me to the park, or I remember when my dad bought me my first corny dog. You can't have that experience if you don't engage the individuals that are a cross section of ages. And so that's what we did. You know, there's a commitment to agency and in really involving the community in all of our decisions that I think has set us apart from some of the past efforts here to really revitalize the community. And I give it a lot of credit for why we've been successful and others have not. 
Members of the community were part of the selection committee that chose Studio MLA as part of competitive process. And when you talk to Miss Anna Hill and Dolphin Heights, who helped choose the designer, and then you bring back that design, and you bring it to her community meeting, and she's able to see the direct result of a decision she made, uh, it's very powerful. Uh, we had young kids from the local schools involved in a lot of that process. We continue to percolate these ideas back out and refine them. Because it's really, uh, like any design process, it's iterative. It's about you know setting a direction, identifying the big mile markers, the big ideas that get you there, but continuing to bring that back and uh, including real community members uh, all the way up to the highest executive levels of our board, uh, I really think has given us a degree of authenticity that we wouldn't have found any other way, even with consultants like uh, Studio Outside, and I see that they're in the room, who are quite literally on the other side of Perry Avenue. They're our neighbor. They're right across the street. It's involving them at all levels that I think has made the difference. Yeah, you go back to In the City for Good, and I see Dan back there as well. The reality is, is that if we didn't identify those 23 distinct neighborhoods, we may, we may have missed something. You can't have a conversation with two individuals around Fair Park and think you're gonna capture every thought process. The other thing I heard is when we were rolling out the master plan, there was, there was a young lady that came up to me and she said, I see what you guys did. You actually listened to what we, and we couldn't get everything we asked for, but you showed us that you were listening and I saw something that one of my neighbors asked for that I didn't really want, but I understand why you made that decision. We had that same process flowed over into the community park as well. That's great. Um, I wanna ask Kitty a couple questions and then we'll open it up to, uh, to the audience here. Didn't wanna leave you out there on the end. Um, there's some really uh, interesting uh, ideas for the Cotton Bowl and for the band shell uh, and for the Coliseum. How did those come about? Was that driven by the community or was that something that the city wanted? How did y'all um, do that process come up? So there was a ton of language and um, sort of design, not design drivers, but project drivers previously established already in the original master plan by Fair Park and Ron's team. And so that was a huge you know, lift off for us when we kicked off the ground. And, and we kicked off the ground about five months ago. So this has been kind of a, a big push to get to this point and get this all ready. And, you know, we've been meeting with um, groups within Fair Park, Spectra. You know, I think Peter Sullivan is our new best friend. Um, we have been under the guise and guidance of Norman Alston, who has been incredibly valuable to this process for us so that we're being pointed in all the right directions. There he is. Raise your hand, Noel. <laughs> and so we've been set up with all the right people. We've got an amazing team of consultants. We've got you know, the best in the business really helping us get this going. So we have been influenced in all the best ways. I know Fair Park has been doing a lot of community engagement of this on their own. And Brian, you might want to speak to that a little bit yourself. But you know, a lot of this has just been influenced by a lot of the, the programmatic needs for these buildings. And a lot of just the, the basic you know, need to breathe some life back into them. You know, and a lot of that is just sort of built infrastructure and kind of, you know, visioning. But Brian, you wanna talk a little bit about the community piece. I, I do for sure. Uh, there's really nothing that we do here that has not been directly and intimately led by community engagement. We didn't begin this process as some of the other folks that bid to manage Fair Park with a beautiful, glossy drawing of what we thought we might do instead we took a harder road. We began with the end in mind and really engaged in a lot of conversations about what this park could be. And almost everybody that we talk to, whether they be in the surrounding neighborhoods or across the Metroplex or across the region nation, they all had a slightly different version of that. And then distilling that down through some of the planning principles under Perkins and Will, under the architectural expertise of Darren and, and Norm, who used to be on our board, he finally figured out it was much better to work for Darren and I than us work for him as a board member. Uh, but it really comes down to the fact that this park has an ability to serve our community very profoundly on a year-round basis, comparable to places like Balboa Park in San Diego, Forest Park in St. Louis, which is maybe the most similar park in the entire nation to what we are. These are World's Fair parks that do function on a year-round basis. Now, admittedly, none of them invented the corny dog, but 
we've got a great partner in the fair, and we also have the single biggest marketing activation in the entire nation to help continue to deliver the life's blood of visitation and revenues that we need. So all of these ideas are built on that same framework and just constantly seeking to refine through that iterative process how we deliver on that promise to be a better neighbor and a better contributor. Wonderful. Well, let's uh, open up, uh, open it up to y'all uh, to ask questions. And uh, maybe if we could have one of the microphones that we could have in the audience. And I'll give mine up. I've talked too you much. Give it up to, yeah, okay. we'll, take, we'll take it away. We'll take it away. For, Nate, maybe if you want to roam around and we'll... All right. Who wants to be the first one? All right. Right over there. We've got, we got a hand raised there. We got, and then you got one right behind her as well. And Norm can't ask any questions. I know I should be able to tell this by the maps that you've shown, but what is in the spot where the park will be? Is it mainly parking? The, park, the current location is right next to Dos Equis Pavilion. It's a surface parking lot now. And then we're taking the adjacent surface parking lot. We're going to put the parking deck, and we're going to, that's going to be a, park, a parking deck hidden behind a park. So if you're standing inside the park, you're not going to be able to see the parking deck. We asked our designer, Ness Gensler and Moody Nolan, to make sure that they kind of put that in, hid that in plain sight, but also presented a good front door to the neighbors across the street in Mill City. Hi. Um, so first of all, this is an amazing plan. It's a master plan. I love it. But the main thing here is going to be transportation. How are we going to get people ease of access here, make them feel safe, because we've had events like the Enchanted where I went to and my family went, but we had all problems with like trying to get on the train and it was just, everybody preferred cars. We need a multimodal way. And I just wanna know how you guys will find a way to find funding or maybe implement some of the funding into transportation, such as MLK Station. So what we've, what we've done is we've taken a very uh, kind of insular view we started out 277 acres boundary in. Now we've started to expand those conversations with NCT COG and some of, some of our other partners to look at how do we start to influence that. We've had conversations with Department of Public Works and DART, uh, Dallas Police Department about traffic ingress and egress. We've talked to Lyft and Uber. Um, so that's an ongoing conversation. We cannot directly affect what happens with uh, state Texas or TxDOT highways or city of Dallas roadways just yet, but the, com the conversations are happening. I'm going to let Brian kind of lean in a little bit more, but Michael Morris with North Texas COG is saying, hey, it's time for us to look at a comprehensive plan to get ingress and egress into the park. Yeah, multimodal and transportation oriented approach is at the forefront of what we do. We talk about it a lot more in the master plan than we were able to entirely go through tonight. Um, but the trail, as an example, identifies another form of modality that we don't have. Uh, there's really no way meaningfully to bicycle safely to the park. Uh, that helps solve for that. We're chatting uh, actually with Michael and Cog tomorrow. Uh, these are ongoing conversations very robustly. And we've had some really favorable discussions with uh, Nadine, the new head of DART. Uh, we are going to be talking about a lot of the infrastructure, and you specifically mentioned uh, MLK. That connection between that and also the Hatcher Street Station, which is connected down Lego, that important thoroughfare our neighbors told us about, uh, that has buffered bike lanes. So now we're able to start thinking about that and how we tie in um, a little more holistically. Well, luckily, there's great organizations that are already working on the reboulevarding of MLK, uh, both at the nonprofit level and then the intergovernmental level. We are always challenged as we're a non-government entity. We're a 501c3, a simple nonprofit, and our authority ends at that property line. But we have a great bully pulpit, uh, and we have the ability to build political consensus that investment is needed in the surrounding area. And that's what's really going to drive those conversations. Doesn't hurt to bring the single biggest sporting event in the world. I don't care how much you love the Super Bowl, World Cup's where it's at. And uh, there, there are additional announcements to come about various programs we anticipate being here in 26 that does present some opportunities to very meaningfully advance some of those improvements. Okay. 
Uh, I'm interested in hearing if you have any plans for the Women's Museum or the old uh, Fine Arts Museum. Thank you. Uh, we do. Uh, we can't be specific, but we have an ongoing process to identify new long-term tenants. Uh, we have evaluated uh, a number of opportunities for both buildings, and uh, though that is a closed process, we can't refer to any specific project. We anticipate announcing something for uh, the former Women's Museum uh, sooner than later. I think we've pretty well identified what that tenant's going to be. And then the old Fine Arts Museum that later became part of the Perot, it's a little bit of a tougher nut to crack because its proximity to uh, Robert B. Cullum is very special. Uh, and of course, its mass is very special. It's a huge building. It's about a quarter million square feet if you include the back of house spaces. And so for a lot of organizations that might seek to come into the park, that's, that's such a huge, tremendous capital lift to get that building where it needs to be. And we've been able to source good partnerships. We think we are beginning to align what the final version of that will be. And I'll pass it back off to Darren. So we've got, we've got a plan to look at unique activities and organizations that come into the park that give you a purpose to drive to Fair Park. The other thing we're asking each of these organizations is to be self-sufficient. So the vetting process is, do they align with the master plan? Do they align with the future vision of the park? Are they gonna activate and bring new visitors to the park because there is a unique place to come discover some certain things. So we have potential tenants for both. Uh, the process is just working through, but we do have individuals identified for both of those. So Doug, you've got the last question. Go ahead. I know that your um, focus is inside the park, but I was wondering if you're advocating at all with the surrounding neighborhoods to develop single family homes and renovate single family homes versus uh, density and apartment development that would be so easy to do. I'm gonna let Darren take the front end of this because we've been very intentional through his leadership at staying outside of certain real estate transactions. The reason for that is there's a huge distrust in the surrounding community, rightly so, given that the last time the community uh, was impacted by the park getting into its space, it resulted in the taking away of so many homes. The first question I heard in that very first community meeting is, are you going to take my home? So we've been very careful about staying outside and staying inside the boundaries because one, as a nonprofit, this is what our task and charter is, is to make sure that Fair Park is, is beneficial. The second thing, we do work with outside organizations, uh, but our intent is to help support them as providing access and advocacy for certain things that they're doing, but we do not lean in directly on that. The one, the one thing I will leave you with is Fair Park now has Fair Park Cultural District. We are the center which goes up to goes up Exposition and Deep Ellum and goes over to South Dallas Cultural Center. So those are things that we can do to help organizations outside and we lean into other nonprofits, but our intent is not to get into any real estate outside of Fair Park and that's why we've been very intentional about not leaning into spaces that we can't directly impact or affect. And that is, that's kind of like the third reel. Is so we stay out of real estate. Fair Park First is not responsible or leaning into any real estate deals outside of the park. Something also that I want to make sure we address here is this is an immense sensitivity to our neighbors, right? There's a huge amount of desire to develop the surrounding area. It's very important that we protect those legacy residents. They're already seeing uh, the negative impacts of the compressed real estate market that we have here in Dallas. And they're people that, frankly, if their property taxes continue to rise without some abatement, uh, we will see the kind of displacement, gentrification. It, it goes by many names, but it's an evil that we've seen all over the country where very typically communities of color are negatively impacted. And this is going to take direct intervention from likely the state level, though we work with organizations like Southern Gateway and the Trinity River Conservancy to try to establish local protections for legacy neighborhoods that may be impacted by these projects that while they drive a higher quality of life, could, if not also balanced with some sort of check on property values, result in that displacement. Unfortunately, you have three major entities that fight over property taxes. It's the city, the county, and the local uh, school district. 
That's why a state intervention is ideal. And in the last legislative session, we advocated very seriously for a measure that would have launched a pilot program around Fair Park to cap property taxes. We think that's very important. We think it needs to be done. Something very similar needs to be done in the areas surrounding Southern Gateway and the areas surrounding the future Trinity Park because they're all going to have um, the impacts of park premium. We are really sensitive to that, but again, as a non-governmental entity, we can't just make it happen on our own. We've got to build consensus, and we hope you'll all join us in helping protect those legacy residents that, frankly, um, if they don't get this sort of intervention, they're, they're not going to be able to afford their property taxes. Well, unfortunately, we have to wrap it up, but uh, I'm sure the panelists will stay a few minutes uh, after if you have some additional questions. Give them a round of applause for all their great comments tonight.